Hello. Um, hi, so a quick agenda what we'll be talking about. So it will be obvious section about who I am, although Isa made us some good job here. Uh, who are we, why we choose autopilot, and we'll go through three uh, lessons we have learned. So uh, I'm a chief architect at Music Glue. We're using Elixir, we're using GCP, and more. I was previously Rubist in Rebased and Colio, you may know that one. Uh, and a Libre, I worked at uh, ebook water barking. Uh, I was also a mentor at Rails Girls, three editions of Rails Girls, and taught some amazing Ruby on Rails uh, people at boot camps in Coders Lab. Um, and who are we? We are a technology company dedicated to empowering the music industry through innovative e-commerce solutions. So that's a obviously big word, but in simple terms, we help artists and music business sell merchandise, things like t-shirts, t-shirts, mugs. Uh, and obviously tickets, and they are an interesting case due to being heavy, traffic heavy, uh, for quite short period uh, of time. So when we started deploying things, it was all Rails on Heroku, and life was easy, right? Then there was some AWS mixed in, etc. But when working with Elixir, we went with Google Cloud Platform and Google Kubernetes Engine. Note that it was quite early time. Some of the features have been unavailable yet, so like attaching huge number of SSL certificates to single load balancer. Uh, so we had to develop our own custom solutions to overcome those limitations. Um, however, during that process, um, some question arises: exactly how much more performance can we squeeze uh, while still saving money when we move to bare metal? Uh, so we rented some powerful boxes from o OVH, started to run, run on that, uh, and learned very quickly that maintaining our own Kubernetes cluster is more or less a full-time job. Uh, especially since we hadn't uh, had a dedicated DevOps at, in the team at that time. So after many pejoratives during the night and problems, we had some revelations, uh, and we made a decision that we remind each other from, uh, from time to time. So that left us with a question. How to avoid overspending while still being in the cloud? Uh, fortunately, in the meantime, Google added a new product, which is Google Kubernetes Engine in autopilot mode, and it was released on 25th of February in 2021. That is the day that they announced it in, on the blog. Uh, and we deployed our first autopilot cluster on 5th of March of 2021, so a little more than a week uh, after it became generally available. So, but why did we choose autopilot for our operations? So, we needed to balance everyday cost effectiveness with the ability to manage unexpected spikes in demand. So in e-commerce e world, there are you know, just regular stuff, uh, especially when we're speaking of tickets or limited edition merchandise. Um, so let's look at the following two screenshots of vCPU count. You can see that our day-to-day -day operation, we're running like seven vCPU, that's all. But during the scale up, we, we got like 60 uh, vCPU very easily. Uh, and that will be quite hard on not autopilot mode. We need to provision new nodes, take care of that, but Google takes care of that for us. So let's start with something we may take for granted using Kubernetes, which is high availability. Um, when using Google Kubernetes Engine autopilot cluster in regional mode, it gives you resilience, as in control plane access. Out of the box. It's like given you don't need to do anything about it. And since we don't control the nodes and the control plane is replicated, um, then we may expect the same for our workloads. However, when using default pod settings and deployment, you can't guarantee that your app, like think stuff deployed on your worker nodes, will be available at any given time. So the solution of moving from you think your app is highly available to your app is really highly available is made up of two parts. Um, pod anti-affinity and pod disruption budget. So to keep things simple, let's just say we're deploying an e-commerce application because I, know, I, 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 I deploy e-commerce application. Uh, as a single container, supporting services are omitted here for simplicity, right? And we're deploying two copies of the app, so two replicas, in order to ensure have a high availability, just like you would normally do in an on-prem environment. So in a nutshell, our deployment is two pods, each consisting of a single container spread somewhere in the Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, so let's just say your cluster have nodes A, B, and C. You can't see them because in, in uh, autopilot you can't see the nodes, but 
they are there. Uh, you can verify this kube, kube CTL. Uh, get notes. Uh, that wasn't highly available, apparently. Uh, so you're deploying two replicas of DAP for the resiliency. However, it so happens that they are both deployed on node A, right? Um, and pod placement is done by the scheduler, so this can obviously happen. Like Google on Autopilot is too optimizing for cost. So from, the, from their point of view, it makes perfect sense. Like deploy on every on one node, and yeah, like whole customer is happy sitting on one node. Uh, but then node A goes down for any reason. If we're lucky and it's planned, uh, our app is going to receive sick term and Kubernetes will start spinning up on second node. Maybe, just maybe, we get away with no downtime. But if it's crash or hardware, fa hardware failure, and yes, there, there's real hardware behind the cloud, then you're suddenly without a copy of a running app. So the solution, you need to specify pod anti-affinity. And it's a very specific instruction given to the scheduler. It means that the pods are steered away from each other and ran on a separate nodes. So think like magnets repelling each other. By using the topology key, Kubernetes EO hostname, you're specifying that you won't want to use the host name as the discriminator, which means that pods will be spread across available nodes. However, since we're using prefer during scheduling, ignore during execution, it means that it isn't hard requirement. So if for any reason GCP is currently running out of nodes, like Google have, a, I don't know, some massive outage or anything, and Kubernetes won't be able to fulfill the spec, Kubernetes will still run two copies of our app, only you know, not taking that into, into account. The opposite policy would be require during scheduling, ignore during execution. But that hard requirement might cause your pods to be stuck on unschedulable states. So not really that good. Um, so if the scheduler is unable to find suitable nodes, it will simply refuse to run them. In autopilot case, it will probably means the cluster needs to scale in order to have new nodes available, but that will take extra time and may be inconvenient at the given time. So as implied by the ignore during execution suffix, these policies have no effect on a pod's runtime lifecycle. Hence, your pods may still end up on the same node in some unlikely turn of events. Cool. So we deployed your pod with anti-affinity. It's now deployed of nodes A and B. Great. However, it turns out they are both in the same zone. You know, obviously, in, in one case, it still makes sense because they can communicate with each other very quickly. Uh, but should that zone go down, then so does your app. And you're out of luck again, basically. Uh, the solution, you need to deploy your app in multiple zones. You can do it using regional cluster, which is the only cluster type available in, uh, in autopilot mode, and specifying the topology key in your deployment pod uh, anti-affinity Z to topology versus EO zone. Cool. You did all of that both. However, now let's just say that Kubernetes control plane is doing node upgrades. Uh, and you guessed it right, node A and C are going to upgrade it at the same time. So in the other words, your app is going to be down. Again, no luck. Solution, you need to use pod disruption budget to limit how many pods can be down at the same time, or at least how many are required um, to be up. And that basically means that at any given point in time, Kubernetes scheduler will do its best to have at least one copy of your pod available. Um, there is one caveat to that, that uh, it means that if, you're, if your deployment relying on node, like you're running out of node to deploy, it will not deploy your app because you, know, you can't get your app to go down, right? So lesson two, that, that concludes lesson one, lesson two, and we need to, so we need to prepare for traffic surges, like we need to, which can come unexpectedly because time to scale up is an important factor here. We don't want to be caught blindsided and we need to first be sure that our HPA, which is horizontal pod autoscaler, can do the right thing. And we need to avoid the scaling gap. I will explain the scaling gap in a moment. So there are visits to our stores. It's from our production services, like everything is smooth and steady and then bam, a big spike. Either a predictable one we're being informed about before or you know, unannounced and spike out of the blue, blue. Let's just say that um, some music band launched some limited edition merch and they just posted it. Um, that means that sometimes there is no time to do any manual operation and scale-up time is crucial. Um, 
So this is something I, I call scaling gap, which means that when you arrive at that point, we'll need to start dropping some requests or we would overflow our application server. So it's in our best interest to keep the gap as short as possible. So while in theory, GKE Autopilot can provision new nodes for us on the fly, there is one problem. Uh, it takes time, right? How much time? Mm, GKE documentation provides us with some estimates. So it's um, 80 to 120 seconds. So adding up the numbers, it's like 100 seconds on average, plus time to download image, image plus app startup time. So in most apps, the node delay would be the biggest factor. So before we start to micro-optimize our app, we need to focus on the biggest delay, which would be the node adding. So what if we could do something clever? like making sure we're requesting as many nodes as possible, while at the same time avoiding using extra resources. Because in GKE and Autopilot, you're built only for vCPU mem assigned to pods. So if it happens that we got only one vCPU used out of four vCPU on the node, then we have free room for scaling up. Uh, so we can call it a free real estate. So how we can do that? Mm. Let's abuse anti-affinity a little bit. Like, mm, just, 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 remember, just remember there's not always a way to do it, um, but we will be working on assumption that we have both staging and production environment in single Kubernetes cluster, right? It's, it's, it's quite important here. So let's set up our pods uh, such that no two staging pods can be on a single node. Each microservice app, copy of anything on staging would land on its own node. Um, and e so this is how our analysis work. So we have one expandable one, which is staging, and one important production. They, they span through many nodes on a single cluster. Um, and before our production is scaled up, we have two namespaces here, which is each pod on this dedicated node, because this is how we set the, set, set, set the antivinity up. And the missing piece of the puzzle here is priority class. So let's convince the Kubernetes scheduler to evict lower priority pods when a new production comes in. Um, so on the scale-up event, all of the staging is evicted, like it's gone, leaving us with, in this case, nine empty nodes to host our production pods. And at the same time, Kubernetes requests new nodes from GCP to host staging on. So the new staging nodes become the buffer for the next scale-up if it's obviously uh, needed. So that moves us to lesson three. And we're working with Elixir app deployed to Kubernetes. We are very often to turn to lib cluster, so we think that we can have all of distributed airline goodness in the dynamic environment. It's not like we can define IPs of the nodes or anything like that. Um, however, lib cluster too have some caveats we need to address. So, first of all, how we can decide that the node is healthy and ready to receive traffic? Like the solution that worked for us. Um, was to define a startup probe, checking if the nodes has already been connected to, uh, to cluster. And this is especially important if we use stuff like PG2 to send message between nodes, because that guarantees that, that we can communicate within the cluster. And the second thing we can do is labeling our, uh, labeling our pod with the application version. Note that due to randomly generated cookie, different releases won't be able to connect to each other. However, they would still be trying to connect, generating unnecessary traffic, like giving us basically nothing. If we do application version labeling, pods will only connect to appropriate pods, reducing in-cluster traffic and log spam. Then we do, then we use the selector in uh, the version in the selector, and voila, like lib cluster will only fetch relevant nodes and only try to connect to relevant nodes. Everything would be good. So given <coughs> our previous optimizations, especially with faster scaling up, we are able to introduce a very specific strategy for rolling out new version. So if we set up the rolling update and max search to, uh, to 100, a new version we, we deployed with the same number of pods that are provisioned for the previous version. In other means, that in other means, that war, the deploys are safe even during high traffic situation because it will spin the exact same number of nodes as previously, uh, as previously serving the traffic. Um, and know that if we're using, if you're using any of that, then important addition to your stack should be also plug Cowboy Drainer. 
It can give you a configurable time after your Apperceive seek terms. When it stops accepting new requests while still processing old ones. Uh, that means that a version switch will occur almost instantaneously. There will be no like, time uh, when your app is hitting the, 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 the traffic is hitting old now. And in the case, we have termination grace period seconds in Kubernetes set to 30 seconds after seek term before actually evicting the pod. But the pod. So life cycle goes like this. We have sent seek term to a pod. pod. It's still alive, but it knows that it, it will be killed. Uh, but it still receives traffic. It still can respond to requests that it originated before. And that combined configuration in the drainer means that no request will hit a termination, terminating version of the pod, but still it will respond to the old request. And since we already span up extra 100% of our pod's capacity, traffic would flow freely even during deployment, giving us almost blue-green deployment without extra operating burden of running like second Kubernetes cluster or service mesh or um, whatever. Mm, as you, we know, the traffic basically must flow all the time. So to illustrate it, before the deployment, we have 12 pods running version A, which is blue of our app. Then when the deployment starts, we put 12 instances of version B, green at once. Traffic is switched after selecting seek term. Sit at that point, blue version isn't accepting any new requests and starts going to the same number of green pods. Uh, so we can call it bluey greeny deployment, right? Um, so, in conclusion, remember this free license. Always ensure we're really doing high availability. Measure scale up time when HP is triggered because that can, that can be a very costly mistake and optimize your configs and use sleep cluster correctly. Thank you, and you can look up the slides. If you scan the code, you'll be linked to the slides if you want to look at them later. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I'm checking the app, and there's one question, mm -hmm. so I'm going to read it out uh, loud right now. Have you considered running Elixir on Google Cloud Run instead of Google Kubernetes? If yes, what prevented you from doing it? Uh, we have some services running Google Cloud Run. However, the problem with Google Cloud Run, Cloud Run is that, the, first of all, you can't, you can't cluster it because you don't have access to such capabilities there, there. Plus, Google Cloud Run is more suitable for stuff like, basically, you can scale down to zero, so you're paying only for time your app is really serving requests. But first of all, if your app scale up time is quite longer, it will give you very slow cold boot. It can be overcome, but you know it, it takes time. Um, and second, um, it's not really suitable for stuff you have like background tasks, all of that, because when your app goes down, your background task will also stop processing. So we need to, you know, however power goes into that, but th that's not that uh, simple and it's uh, extra work that needs to be done. 